Sebastian's gonna get angry. The viewers are gonna get angry. They're gonna think I'm procrastinating. They're gonna think I don't care about them. They'll make me feel guilty. That, this is ridiculous, okay? The movie isn't that bad, but I, I'll just, I'll, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, it, I'll go. Shit. God damn it. Hey guys, I am the Cooler Diego, and I'm stranded here on Cinemageddon Reviews. Today I'm here to talk to you about The Amazing Spider-Man. This is part of my boring counterpart series of Spider-Man reviews. I can't say I'm excited to be here, but whatever. Let's get this over with. So before we get started, I should warn you that this is going to contain spoilers. I actually had to watch this movie to get an accurate review of it. And if you can tell by my demeanor, I had a pretty good time with it. So just let that be your warning. All right, let's go. So after Spider-Man 3 disappointed a lot of people, Sony decided it was time to reboot the franchise. There were original plans for a fourth Tobey Maguire film, but they never really came to fruition. Ultimately, the time had passed for Spider-Man 4, and it was time for a new version of the character, one that went in an entirely new direction and told an unconventional and unpredictable story. In fact, this movie was marketed often as the untold story. They had brought in a whole new cast of people and a relatively new director named Mark Webb who had just done 500 Days of Summer, one of my favorite indie films of all time, and it seemed like things were shaping up to be a new and different version of Spider-Man. And this movie failed in being just that, in fact it often struggles to be different in any way from the 2002 Sam Raimi film, and because of that it's also far inferior. I'll be the first to admit, I liked this movie when it first came out, as did a lot of folks from what I understand, but the more times I watched it over the years, the less I liked it, and now finally I understand that this really isn't that great of a Spider-Man movie. However, before we go down that road, I must admit that it's also not the worst one. There are a few things that I like about it. First of all, I think Andrew Garfield was an excellent choice to play Spider-Man. When he's in the suit, you can tell he's really eating up this role. He has the right charisma, the body language, the physicality, but I do feel like the writers could have improved the quipping side. Most of this movie has pretty non-existent quips, except for one scene that's just completely overloaded with him to the point of being annoying. What the hell is this? Webbing that I developed myself. I don't think you really want to know. Come right on, now. let me go. Stop, get off, man. No. Come on, let me go. Stop it. <laughs> this may be a controversial opinion, but his costume is one of my favorite live action suits. It's got a homemade feel to it, but it's also radically unique from any other suit, and in a good way. A lot of people don't like it because it looks too much like a basketball, it's too orange, but honestly, I like the way it looks. Something about it just works for me. However, Peter Parker is kind of a weirdo, and a little creepy. When he's not in the suit, he often acts like he's high or drunk or something, and he has this weird stalkery habit of keeping non-consensual pictures of Gwen Stacy on his camera and his com computer. Are, are people supposed to relate to this? Well, hello there. Who are you? As far as supporting characters, I think Emma Stone is great as Gwen Stacy. This character in this movie is a much better love interest than Mary Jane Watson was in the Raimi trilogy. And she's also really good on her own, too. This is a much more memorable and likable presence. In fact, many people, meaning me too, would love to see Emma Stone come back if they ever did a live-action Spider-Gwen movie. Now that they've done a live-action Spider-Verse movie with No Way Home, I think this could be a great opportunity to expand that franchise even further and make Gwen Stacy a part of that in the future. I also think Sally Field and Martin Sheen did a great job as Uncle Ben and Aunt May. Not only do the actors do a good job, but you can tell there's a strong emotional connection there, and the movie does a good job of making you care about them and their relationship to Peter. However, I will say that Aunt May seems conveniently oblivious to the fact that Peter's Spider-Man. I mean, when he comes home beaten to a pulp multiple times throughout the movie, she always seems completely dumbfounded by it. She never puts two and two together, even when the clues are just so obvious. Now going back to the plot, I wouldn't say this movie is completely indistinguishable from the 2002 movie. 
In fact, the first 30 minutes of this film are actually pretty interesting and original. It felt like the untold story we were supposed to get. The opening few scenes explore a little bit about the disappearance of Peter Parker's parents and their ties to Oscorp. I was actually thoroughly invested in the mystery behind it and how Oscorp and their experiments tied into that. And then Uncle Ben dies, and the movie falls into the rut of being too familiar. It becomes a revenge story, which, don't get me wrong, it could have been great anyway, except in order to go down this road, it had to completely abandon the other storyline. Peter just seems to forget why this all got started in the first place. Then the plot takes this weird turn after Peter gets the full Spider-Man suit and stops being about him getting revenge for his uncle's death, and instead becomes just about him stopping the lizard, which doesn't make sense for him at this point in the story. Why? Some folks might give the excuse that during the dinner scene with Captain Stacy, he comes to the realization that he's kind of selfish for going down this path for revenge, and he's only trying to convince himself that he's a good guy trying to do a good thing. That's all good and well, but personally, I think one pep talk from some random guy you just met isn't enough to convince someone not to seek revenge for the death of a loved one, especially when they've already spent so much time and effort doing so. And so for Peter to just suddenly feel compelled to take responsibility for this just feels so rushed. That's when I noticed something about the plot in this movie, and that is that Peter doesn't really have any strong goals, or at least any single goal that he's working to achieve. He wants to find out what happened to his parents, and then he wants to avenge his uncle's death, and then he needs to take down the lizard, but none of these goals seem connected to each other by any sort of character arc or central theme. Let's take the 2002 Sam Raimi movie, for example. The theme of that movie was power and responsibility. Peter wants to get the girl, because it's who he's been crushing on his entire life, and he feels like his powers can help him do that. And then he wants to avenge his uncle's death because he feels guilty that he shrugged off his responsibility to help others, so he could help himself instead. And then when he gets his revenge and he realizes that that won't help him feel better, he wants to help people as Spider-Man because he learns that with great power comes great responsibility. Which is why, when he comes face to face with the Green Goblin, that conflict feels warranted by how much the character has changed, and because that change feels earned. In this movie, Captain Stacy dies and makes Peter promise to stay away from Gwen because he's Spider-Man and it's dangerous for her to be around him. That lasts for about 10 minutes, and then it paints Peter as the hero for completely backtracking on the whole power and responsibility thing, and it's just so dumb. Don't make promises you can't keep, Mr. Parker. Yeah, but those are the best kind. Okay, class, open your books. This isn't a very clear path in The Amazing Spider-Man. The main character's change isn't as apparent, so you can't really connect with the story as well. And therefore, the eventual confrontation with the lizard feels so out of left field. Which brings me to my least favorite part of this movie, and that is the villain. Now, let me make it clear that Reese Ifans is a great actor, and he does his best with what he's given here, but the Lizard is probably my least favorite villain in a Spider-Man movie of all time. There's a reason that he was sidelined for a majority of No Way Home. What is his motivation? Kurt Connors wants his missing arm back because, without that, he can't turn into the lizard. God. I mean, we can assume that he feels like an outcast based on how he acts, but this doesn't really feel too well established. There doesn't really seem to be anything that him missing an arm is holding him back from. There's nothing to root for here. I mean, yeah, Irfan Khan shows up every now and then to remind him that he's running out of time to save Norman Osborn, but it still tells us nothing about Connors himself, and him trying to regrow his arm doesn't have any connection to that. And then once he actually becomes the Lizard, his character becomes even more nonsensical, because out of nowhere he gets this weird superiority complex. I sought to create a stronger human being, but there's no such thing. Human beings are weak, pathetic, feeble-minded creatures. So his plan becomes about turning all of humanity into lizards because I guess he feels that human beings suck, which, don't get me wrong, we kind of do. But this is just such a weird plan because aside from petty revenge against whatever or whoever made him feel inferior in the first place, there's no emotional factor in this plan. It makes the lizard feel less three-dimensional and more like a cartoon villain from the 80s. You can tell the writers just couldn't think of anything to do with this character and it just it feels so dumb. Can't make a dent in this headache, man. Also, the villain being written this terribly doesn't warrant much of a connection to Spider-Man, much unlike the Green Goblin in the Raimi films. In this movie, there's nothing Kirk Connors has to lose by giving in to this lizard alter ego. He gains power and loses nothing, and for that reason, you can't really connect with him as much. So overall, The Amazing Spider-Man is not completely horrible. There are some really good performances and some good ideas toward the beginning of the film, but overall, it's just a very lackluster movie that mostly fails at being different from the Raimi films, and is mid at best at the parts that are different. And so for that reason, my rating for The Amazing Spider-Man is 5 out of 10.
So dumb. So dumb. I, I need to watch something with, with better writing. Star Wars. Mad Max Fury Road. Knives out. So dumb. So dumb. I mean, what fucking babe? Jeez. I mean, the movie wasn't even that bad. But I give a fictional character two little videos to do and he has to act all whiny and... Oh. Whoa. Um. Hmm. Forgot about that one. Ugh. That's... That's not good, no. Hmm. Alright, next.